Hello, and welcome to the latest episode of the Fablographers Inside the Photographer's Mind. Today, we're joined by Alex Miller, aka Liquid Verve. Before we get into the show, a quick reminder to please subscribe to the podcast via YouTube, Spotify, Google, and Apple Podcasts. Right, let's get into it with Alex. Hello, Alex. Hi, how are you? How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Jurassic Park? Yes. <laughs> I stole the shirt from my roommate and I never gave it back. <laughs> yeah. She is fully aware of this transaction, so it's okay. Oh, okay. No, that's you know, she's not going to be kind of coming in through the show like, <laughs> hey. <going> <laughs> no, I stole it about like a year ago. So I think by now she knows, you know, I wear it constantly. So I, I think the, the, the new trailer is coming out soon for a new Jurassic Park as well, which will be, um, I don't know if you're taking any interest in that. I have chosen to ignore pretty much every Jurassic Park film that is recent, so okay. I will take your word for it. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, we're obviously not here to speak about dinosaurs, as, as exciting as they are. We're here to talk about um, photography, and more importantly, you. And it's, I think what we'll start with is, so your name's Alex, Alex Miller, obviously. Mm -hmm. but you also go by the alias uh, Liquid Verb, and I, mm -hmm. I just wondered, well, where did that kind of name come from? What do you prefer to be called and addressed as out in the, the photo industry? Um, so, I mean, I, I do generally prefer when people call me Alex. Some people don't know my name and then they'll call me Liquid. Uh, a lot of people think I'm a guy because it's a very, uh, the portrait photography corner is very male dominated. Um, so especially when they see Alex, they usually think, oh, must be a dude. Um, but that's fine. Um, I, I, came up with a name because I've, I've been doing art for a long time. I started playing the violin when I was three, started painting early, playing the piano when I was seven. I used to write classical music when I was a kid. And then um, I got really into random other art forms, got into filmmaking when I was seven, went to school for films. I actually have a Bachelor of Fine Arts. And then I got into photography about four years ago. So to me, it's just always been um, irrelevant what the medium is. I just am very into art. And so... Yeah. Verve is a synonym for, you know, passion and vigor and enthusiasm. And I'm just kind of that. I'm very liquid in terms of my passion. So, yeah. So four years, I, you know, looking at your work, you'd think you've been shooting a lot longer than four years. Because four years is, is, is well, relatively you. speaking, in our, in our hopefully long lives, is, isn't that much of a, of a, <laughs> a long time. But so, so how what what was it? What what took you after experimenting or enjoying different um, disciplines within the the art umbrella? What what got you to actually picking up a camera? Um, I was dating somebody at the time who was a phenomenal uh, landscape and um, product photographer. Like he shot these really cool, just weird still life images. Um, and I was in film school at the time, so I had a lot of really beautiful actresses around. And he was like, "You could shoot." just the just the girls around shoot still images of them if you ever you know if you're ever bored of film and so I did I started shooting like portfolio images and then it just escalated really quickly and then you know, I, I went full-time after about um like a year and a half yeah well uh, so, uh, time out time so, <laughs> so you picked up a camera and then 18 months later you're a full-time photographer have I understood that right yes that's correct wow so look do, do you think it was kind of, I know this, I, I'm trying to think how to, to phrase this question, because do you think kind of your background in art kind of allowed you to accelerate the photographic medium? Do, do, you, think, do you think it's kind of a, 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 a linear thing rather than just starting it and then, you know, learning from scratch? Yes, I, I definitely think that I came in with most of the skills already kind of uh, cured and then I just kind of laterally applied them to photography so in from film from my degree probably about 80 percent of it carried directly over even though I do no film anymore um, but it's between you know composition lighting coloring like I studied I studied just color for you know months at a time um, directing actors is very similar to directing models there's just so much overlap mm -hmm. and um and then other things carried over from other places. So I actually used to do makeup professionally, which is random. Okay. <laughs> and cool. so that carried directly into retouching. So I was able to really accelerate my retouching study because I already knew, you know, what kind of uh, 
what kind of aspect shape the face and the eyes and the individual elements of of the face and how they impact the whole. And so it's a ton of little things like that, like the fact that I used to draw and paint very much applied into compositing and so on. Yeah. That's an, that's an amazing journey in such a short amount. Did, did it ever kind of work against you? Did you find like once you got kind of into the professional scene when you were telling people that you, you know, hadn't been doing it relatively that long? Did did anyone have kind of a, do you find it hard to get people to take you seriously? I guess is what, what I'm trying to ask. Did you ever have any struggles with that? No, it was kind of the opposite. I had, sometimes I, I was just overwhelmed by how quickly it was all going. So actually yeah. in my first year, I took a ton of time off. I did, I think I did like three months of it. And then I just kind of spaced out for six months. I was like, I'm not doing this anymore. This was like, everybody now wants photos of me and I don't have time. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I went back to it and then I obviously stuck with it. So yeah, I, I've definitely, um, I've definitely been very fortunate to, to be taken seriously by, by all the communities that I've been involved in. Good for you. You know, that's, you. That's, uh, we, we love to hear stories like that because I think, you know, look, the reality is for, for many photographers, it, it will, the journey will be a long one. Um, and as will yours, you know, into, you know, still learning and, and still developing and things like that. But I think it's also your story can be used as a kind of a, a source of inspiration that, hey, look, you know, if, if, if you're serious about it and you, you've, you've got that, that talent, which you clearly do, then you know, the, the possible, it doesn't always have to be a, you know, 10 year down the line, I'll become a professional. No. Yeah, um, it can be, it can be, it can be really quick. It just depends on how hard you fight for it. So from the point where I really started taking photography seriously and started working on it every day um, to where I went full time, it was uh, less than 10 months. So, yeah. <laughs> now, now, now you said that, um, and, you know, I don't, I don't want to try cause any trouble here, but but you, you you said that obviously, you know, with your name being Alex, a lot of people mistake you sometimes as being a man before they meet you. And you're also in an environment that's that's dominated um, by men. And you said, you know, that that's how but is, is there a little bit of a chip on the shoulder isn't the right phrase that that makes it sound like you're the problem. But it, it does a part of you feel like that you have to fight a little bit harder or that you feel that you're fighting to to not just on your own but you know female portrait photographers do you feel like you're you're fighting to validate yourselves within the space and show that hey look we're here and we can do this it's regardless of you know gender or identity and things like that um i think so yes i i will say once again i i am inc incredibly grateful for how i have been treated um mm. by the communities that i've been a part of um and i will say it's a huge huge advantage when working with models they're often considerably more comfortable with a female photographer than a male photographer. So that's great. Um, and I've never been treated badly or mistreated or not being taken seriously or not respected because I'm a woman. So I want to say that up front. Excellent. I think the difficult thing is to convince other women that they're going to do just fine. Mm -hmm. um, it's just often women are not as motivated to start portrait photography. They'll go into, you know, weddings or I don't know what other, you know, family photography or something like that. But the portraits that we kind of do, um, it's just very male dominated. Um, and then I do feel like I've had to kind of adjust my personality a little bit to keep up with just a very masculine profession, but I've had that going on for the last decade because film was the exact same way, you know, like 3% of the director's guild of America are women, 3%. Okay. You know, like uh, as a female, <laughs> I'm suddenly a minority. I'm like, I'm not a minority. I'm very white. You know what I mean? So, um, so yeah those those things sometimes i think um i think we've got a, a long ways ahead of us to to make women feel like they can step into the space just as much as men yeah. and, and has it always been portrait photography with you is that the, have you ever kind of ventured into kind of other practices whether it's for work or fun not really to be honest i've um i've never even really considered it because what i like about portrait photography is the interaction the communication uh, mm -hmm. with a model and that's what I you know loved in film and that's what I love here in portrait photography so working with inanimate objects or environments has never really been on my radar so well, one thing I'm interested to, to ask you is because your portrait photography um I think it's fair to say it's it's far from your standard hey stand there and smile you know it's it's not a headshot kind of thing and it incorporates so so much so much story 
so much kind of in a way theatrics yeah. with, with movement and body and stuff like that uh, you know for, for for someone even even for the most experienced model you know it how do you communicate exactly what you want um and kind of what challenges do you tend to to face when you're like hey this is the idea um and this is what you need to do like how, what, what's that like um well, I will say the the biggest tip that I can give or the biggest asset that I have for those situations is the fact that I work with the same models over and over. So, you know, you'll see two or three models just repeatedly on my portfolio and we've done, you know, 20, 25 shoots together. And so that f- facilitates communication so much. Um, and we understand each other very well. And then it also becomes a very collaborative process where it's not everybody's being polite and it's like, oh no, what do you want to do? I don't know, what do you want to do? Um, you know, cause sometimes it can be like that when you're shooting. Yeah, false niceness. Yeah, it's, you know, especially I think, um, I'm German, so I'm very direct, but- um, And I'm British, so I'm very false nice. (laughs) (laughs) Also, you know, Americans can be very, very polite. And, you know, they don't want anybody's feelings and everybody's sensitive and that's okay. Um, you know, and it's very, it can be very proper. So it can make it very difficult to communicate in art where you're just trying to get to the final result and you're trying to have a good time getting there. So, yeah. Um, but generally it is surprisingly easy when you do have that good communication and when you don't have it, it's incredibly difficult. So I will say that is like 80% of it, but truly, I mean, some of the movement shots that I've done, some of the weird, like hair flips or some of the weird cosplay stuff I've done. I just, I communicated ahead of time. Then we do one or two tests. We usually do tests without the camera. We just try the movement. Um, Sometimes I'll record it on an iPhone in slow motion so that they can see what the movement itself looks like. Then we'll choose kind of a point of the movement to capture. I usually don't shoot on like continuous shutter. I usually deliberately choose one moment from it. Um, Yeah. And then we go and shoot it and off, I mean, knock on wood, but we've, gotten very lucky with a lot of shots so it's been great yeah they're 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 incredible i I was just 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 today i was looking at the um the set that you did uh you had a model and it it must have been near an airport and you know you you have the planes i think it was Mm. just flying over and I, i was just like the attention to detail is admirable to be honest with you and i wondered like how 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 do these concepts come to life? Is it like three o'clock in the morning? You just wake up and you're like outside an airport. Like, what's the <laughs> <laughs> well, what's so that your kind of creation? That one was a collaboration with my friend John, and he's done a couple of these airport things. Mm. Um, and um, by the way, I don't know if you can hear the yard work. It's kind of loud. I can. I can. Okay, good. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah so so i i work with katie a lot who's the model in that and i was like what if we did airplane plus dress toss plus hair flip because we can combine cool things um so that was just a logical progression but generally a lot of the things i i like to look at more traditional art um Mm -hmm. uh like impressionist paintings or even you know modern art that is more of like graphic design or or digital artwork and those pieces often don't take reality into account as much as photography does because Mm -hmm. in photography we just kind of ground ourselves to being like well this is what we can't do what if we don't worry about what we can do what if we just think about what do we want to do if we could do anything and then figure out how to get there yeah right so i don't know if you saw it but i did a black widow shot um from the film where she's like falling out of the sky because this thing exploded and she's sliding down a building but yeah midair and i was sitting in the theater with the model that i was going to shoot it with and we had seen it in the trailer we were like oh it looks like she's sliding off a building and i was sitting in the theater and turns out the building is also falling out of the sky and i look over at her and i'm like i'm not shooting that and she's like please <laughs> <laughs> And so then we set out to figure out how on earth we could accomplish that. And the way we ended up accomplishing it was that we shot her in a playground, hanging off of a thing. Um, so it was the correct, you know, gravity and movement. And then we yeah. moved her in. So everything's possible, but it's just, you got to take that block out of your imagination that says, stick with what you can do instead of what you want to, you know. So, so when I'm listening to you talk about that, um, it, you know, the look on your face and just also just listening to the actual environment. It, it sounds like 
so much fun, but with, with so much to think about, it, are you able to enjoy it in the moment or is it quite stressful when you're creating? It depends. Um, it really depends. I've had, I've had shoots that are just, that just kind of go, they just kind of yeah. flow and they're easy. And it's, and then when you get that shot, it's such an amazing feeling. And then I've had shoots where the shoot itself has been so incredibly stressful. And I'm like, we're not going to get this. We have not gotten it. It is not going to happen. And then you're sitting in the editing room and you're like, oh, we totally got it. It was totally fine. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. You know? laughs> That's happened to me so many times when I come home and I'm like, we, this did not, this was a complete failure. And then as soon as I see it on a computer, I'm like, oh, it's totally cool. And then the editing process is usually a lot of fun and finishing up the final result is also a lot of fun. See, that, that's interesting in terms of the editing. So I, I'm someone who I, I, I don't dislike editing. I don't, I just dislike doing it for too long. So I will, I will personally, you know, there's, there's lots of different um, aesthetics in photography. And I think sometimes those who like to edit and those who like to do minimal edits, we get into this little like, what's better war? And, it, you know, it doesn't really matter. You do what's right for you. Yeah. Um, I agree. So, so what what is your your editing process like? How how long is that in terms of how how much do you time do you spend? Because with with you being you know very artistic, I I'm very much a oh that'll do kind of person. Um, <laughs> I'm sensing you probably aren't. Am I am I right there? What what are you like? It definitely depends, right? So um, sometimes I'll just shoot something and it'll be lit very specifically and. I'll shoot it with filtration and it'll be pretty much good to go out of camera. Um, I'll do a little bit of something in Lightroom and then I'll call it a day and I can do an edit in two minutes. Um, and then there are those edits that are very complex where it's just kind of like, like you, I don't like spending too much time at a time. So usually I kind of cap out at two or three hours. Okay. So I'll sit with something, then maybe I'll sit with something else. Then I'll go back to the first thing. And then after two or three hours of a session, I'll just kind of call it a day and I'll come back to it. And I don't hesitate to edit something over the course of maybe like a week or a month, even sometimes that's rare. Um, yeah, but I, I find that there are so many ebbs and flows to creativity, mindset, mood. Um, some things need to be done with discipline. Some things we just need to sit down and say, well, I got to get this done now. So it's going to get done. But then when it comes to these creative things where we're waiting for inspiration to find us and we're waiting for the right idea and we're waiting to creatively problem solve, I think we have to be responsive to our natural flow. And if the natural flow says, just give it a day of rest and come back, you know, on Thursday, then I shall do that. <laughs> yeah. Do, do you have any kind of processes that, that help you? Because you know sometimes you're right it it might feel a bit tedious but it needs doing um other than kind of stepping away are there any other processes whether it's music or wine or whatever you know is, is there anything that helps you kind of zone in and forget the rest of the world and, and get the edit done um yeah i'm really into those youtube videos where you like put on um like a rain sound that goes on yeah. for eight hours i'm not a music <laughs> person i don't listen to a lot of music but i'll listen to rain and <laughs> I just put that up on my second monitor and it'll just be, you know, like a little log cabin with rain on the windows and it's very peaceful. <laughs> 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 it's a little weird. I don't know. Maybe I'm, I'm quite surprised too. that you don't listen to being such, such a creative uh, mind. It's, it's surprising that you don't listen to much music. Usually, you know, not that it's a bad thing, but it, it's usually artists, you know, they're, they're into their music. And, you know, it's, it's kind of goes hand in hand with creativity. I've always, um, this is a very unpopular opinion, but I've always found that to create art, you must not consume art. And it's always been like that for me. I've always disliked going to concerts. I've had a hard time going to the opera and the theater and watching movies. I don't watch television. I don't listen to a lot of music. Um, I don't, um, I don't even, once in a while I'll go to a museum, but I have very limited capacity for it. So wow. art intake for me is super different than art output. Yeah. I, I, I never ask this question because I just think it's an over asked question. And, you know, but, you know, a lot of photographers get asked about who their inspirations were photographically. But I, I take it probably you don't have any. Um, you know, not 
Not really. I think there were definitely some along the way. Um, there's a German photographer called Kai Böttcher. He was very much like the person that initially made me realize that portraits could be more than just a headshot. Mm -hmm. um, so when I was first starting, my entire first year was very much shaped around like, I want to build a style just as much as this guy has a style. I wasn't trying to copy his style by any means, but, um, but otherwise, no, I don't really look to other photographers to inspiration, to be honest. And, you know, it, it sounds surprising that you don't consume art, but when you think about it, you know, in other mediums or disciplines, fields, whatever we call it, you know, some people like playing sports, but they don't like watching sports. And exactly. you know, we kind of go, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Um, right. So why shouldn't it make sense in this regard? You know, that's that's what I think. So yeah, yeah. keep creating. <laughs> keep creating, forget consuming. In fact, I'm going to consuming. <laughs> but that's why when you said Jurassic Park I was like I don't know I don't really I don't know how to watch movies <laughs> I've seen the new Spider-Man you know what I mean which is embarrassing because uh, yeah so when did you decide because you know aside from just the photography you do you're also heavily involved in kind of like coaching and tutorials and, mm -hmm. and things like that when when was that kind of a, when did you decide to go down that path so that's actually what flipped me into full time um, very early. So I went full time around the time that I had around 17,000 followers on Instagram. Um, and then my full time income came from teaching and only, you know, only a portion of it was from, you know, client work or brand work or whatever else I was doing at the time. And it was, I think I just leaned pretty far out the window very early in terms of editing style. Um, I think I was just doing weird stuff that not a lot of other people were doing. And so I started getting a lot of requests to make an editing tutorial. And at the time I was friends with another photographer who had made a tutorial and he was like, yeah, you can totally do that because I, you know, I'm over here like a photographer baby. And I'm like, I don't think I should teach anybody. <laughs> He's like, oh, no, 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 you're fine. He kind of supported me through it. And I, I put it out and it, it did incredibly well. And so, you know, since then I've gone on to create like nine more courses. Um, a lot of them I've uh, just created new versions of old ones because I believe in updating and improving, um, yeah. you know, old products. And I'll send, I'll send those new versions to the people who have purchased the old course, because again, I, I just believe in, in updating quality over time. Um, it's been a really great process because I think through teaching, there's so much opportunity opportunity to learn mm -hmm. um because when you teach it the information goes out of your head and looking at it objectively from the outside brings a new understanding to it so it's just so been a wonderful you, experience so do you feel like you're by teaching others also teaching yourself is am i understanding that correctly yes yes i believe that it i believe that the moment that you teach you gain a better understanding for the information yourself so I would recommend anyone to teach, even if they feel like they're not ready to, even if they are not comfortable charging for it yet. I, I taught so much for free when I first started, mm -hmm. um, you know, one-on-one -on -one and, and that kind of stuff. I just, it, it helped me so much. Um, and I just think, I just, I just think teaching is such a beneficial process for the teacher. So again, I would, I would recommend it to anyone, even if they don't feel like they're ready yet. So so you do uh, different types of teaching. You do one on one, but you, so someone can buy a course, which I guess is is the course kind of it's like pre made. So there's not actual interaction, but they they have an option for one on one as well. And how how do you plan? How do you develop a tutorial where it's like well, what's that process like? Because you know I, I know a lot about photography. I've been I've been doing this for for ten or so years. But I, you know whenever I think about I, I write tutorial tutorial articles, but when I think about putting a course together, I'm like my brain's just you know spinning it's around like, there's like a monkey yeah. clapping a tambourine I'm like <laughs> do I even do I even have a camera you know that, that, <laughs> how, how, how do you how do you plan that and put it together and get it to a point where you're like that's ready right um <clears throat> so I will say most of the process is actually conceptualization it's that exact thing wrapping my mind around all of the information that somehow needs to be consolidated and communicated in a, you know, concise and digestible manner. Mm -hmm. um, and so usually each course, I would say I conceptualize for anything around three to six months. Um, 
some of them even longer than that. So for example, my compositing course, I conceptualized it for probably like one or two years where I just did not feel like the information was ready for me to communicate properly. And so during that time, I'll kind of just collect. It'll also be super beneficial to teach that material one-on-one -on -one during that time, because then I can see what people receive and what kind of doesn't, you know, work. Um, yeah, then I'll collect it, I'll compile it. I'm very organized. So then I'll put together an outline based on the outline and put together a script and I start collecting the visual assets. Um, all of the courses are extremely like dense and refined, anything between like three to seven hour courses. So they're really meant to be the equivalent of a multi-week college course. Okay. Um, so they're also meant to be, you know, I try to structure them in a way that people can either, certain courses are meant to be watched in order. Certain ones are meant to be, you know, watched buffet style where you can kind of just pick and choose whatever you're trying to learn that day. And then other ones are meant to kind of be watched linearly and you can stop any time that you feel like you're done or you're ready, like you've learned enough. So, um, so yeah, that, that conceptualization process is honestly the most complex one because it's a, since there is no one-on-one -on -one interaction, it's tough to create the content in a way that will work for as many people as possible, no matter what their skill level is and no matter what their attention span or level of understanding is. Um, from then on, it gets very easy. Then I just, I prep for like two weeks. I record usually for two to four weeks and then I edit for two to four weeks and that's it. Do you, do you, do you have a lot of downtime? It seems like you're always doing something. <laughs> do you, do you, no, do you have... I never have downtime. <laughs> you know, I take like 10 martial arts classes a week. <laughs> um, can, can I ask what discipline you do in martial arts? I, so it's called Pakwa. Okay. And it's not a lot of people know it, but it's uh it's actually eight different disciplines. Paco is the overarching term between mm -hmm. um martial arts, tai chi, archery, uh acrobatics, energy, which is more of a theory class, um kickboxing and so on. So it's meant to be a full and complete kind of program of physical conditioning and I take not all of those but many of them. Um so I think that's nice. what keeps me alive, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> Do you feel it helps fuel creativity? Because it, it's very much a psychological process, martial arts, you know, and, and very, um, a, a, aside from the physical and the defense um, elements, you know, the, the, the mental benefits, the mental health kind of thing um, are, are plenty. Do, do you find it helps you be zen and, and allow creativity to come to your brain? Yes. Um, I think the most important thing, if people are trying to have sort of ideas or thoughts come to them, mm -hmm. uh, the most important thing is to make space for them. And I think most of us keep our glasses really, really, really full where we're constantly just kind of spilling, but there's yeah. no space for more water, you know? Yeah. So that makes it very difficult to then receive information from, you know, the universe or whatever you believe in. That's, you know, I don't want to get strange. Um, <laughs> Hey, get strange. We love it. You know, it's, uh, <laughs> I don't do, do what you want, but you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, again, to to each their own philosophy, but um, yeah. I do think information is readily available whenever we are prepared to receive it. But we must have the space for it. So um, I'm sure everybody's heard this a million times, but meditation creates that space. Mm -hmm. um, having actual physical space creates that space. That's why you see my room is very. There's just kind of a lot of space. Yeah. It's very high ceilings. And it makes me feel like there's space for things, you know? Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know. Uh, the more, I think that the more mental clutter we have and the more physical clutter we have, the more difficult it is to be ready for new things. Yeah. And I, and I, I think I say to, to photographers and I try and say to myself, cause you know, we, we, we're always good at preaching, but we're not always good at practicing. Right. But, um, mm -hmm. totally. it's, it's sometimes, yeah, to, to, to stop creating just for a little bit of time, just to allow yes. things. Cause sometimes we try and just force it and force it and like, Oh, if I keep going, it, it will come. And I think sometimes the, the best things to do is kind of look away from the camera or put the camera away or down and go do something else. Now, you, mm -hmm. you said uh, you, you stepped away for six months. That, that's right. Uh, when, when you first. Yes, but that was just my first year because I wasn't prepared to commit to photography. Go. But usually I'll take I'll take usually like two to four weeks 
off in like in one piece okay. every six to 12 months. I think it's really important to take breaks. But then throughout that time, you just hardcore foot on the pedal creating um, when, when, when you're not taking breaks. So you say you take a break every six to 12 months, mm -hmm. but no breaks in between. Like you have down days at least. Are you, are you, or do you, yeah, do you yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. I promise I've been getting better, you know, um, <laughs> Is I think especially being self-employed, work-life balance is always going to be a huge challenge. Like how would yeah. it not be? Especially yeah. when we have like I have a natural inclination to become a workaholic. I I graduated high school when I was sixteen, and you know um, moved out immediately because I was like college. Um, yeah. I, I think I've been a workaholic since I was four. So. <laughs> yeah. so I've never been worried about not getting the work done. I've been always worried about. I've, I'm constantly burnt out and such. And so over the last couple of years, that's been the biggest journey is trying to bring in those other aspects and the breaks and, you know, bringing in the social interaction that we need to balance and the physical stuff like martial arts and yeah. going outside once in a while, I've heard is really cool. Okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's been getting better. It's, it's been a long journey. <laughs> <laughs> Please do go outside. Yes, it's uh, it's uh, it's yeah, a nice world out there. I'm get a sunburn. <laughs> Although, uh, to be fair, I, I did read that you you prefer um, creating in nature rather than like a studio kind of environment. Is that right? Yes, absolutely. Because I just prefer natural light and working okay. with that. Um, studio light's okay, but I will I will never really find the same quality of light as you do when you have, you know, a sun setting and you're bouncing that light back onto the model with a, just a classic white bounce board and it just looks immaculate. I will, I will never find that same quality in a studio. I, just won't. I agree. I, 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 you know, I don't really do portraits or anything like that, but, um, well, I do, I do street portraits where I just stop a random stranger and I'm like, you're a model now. Oh, that's but, so cool. <laughs> yeah. How does that work? No, it's fine. You know, I, I remember I did my, I, I still remember the first, um, person that I asked it, it was a girl she was just on a, a lunch break uh, this was when I was living in London and I she must have thought like I was some weirdo because <laughs> and, <laughs> because thinking about it now she had every right to think this by the way because I was mustering up the courage to ask to make her portrait uh -huh. so I just kept walking up and down the street past her <laughs> just <laughs> hovering and looking back now, I'm thinking, you know, with all that we, we've become aware of over the past five or six years in, in terms of, you know, the, the experiences women go through, which I think probably a lot of men weren't fully, you know, aware of or maybe we were ignorant to. Looking back now, she must have thought, this guy's a predator, this guy's a devil. Oh, no. <laughs> and then I'm walking over to her and I'm like, you. Now, obviously, I wasn't aggressive. But since that moment, yeah, I think I found a way to communicate with people. And it, it, it's a lovely feeling when 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 someone's just going about their day. Because this sounds arrogant. I don't mean this in, in terms of because it's me. I just mean in general. But I think if anyone stops someone on a normal day to make their, their photo, that's probably on average going to be the most meaningful thing that happened in their day. Yeah, um, absolutely. And, it, you know, it, it's a lovely feeling to do that, to, 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 to stop someone and say, hey, I think you're cool, or, you know, I love the way you dress, or I like your kind of demeanour, and I just want to capture that, and off I go. And I started yeah. going through a phase where I started approaching, like, men who look like they could kill easily, because I thought, oh. you know, <laughs> and, and, you know, 10 times out of 10, they were just soft teddy bears um, you know, so, and it, I, it, it's been a really good experience for me and I, I advise photographers do this as well to kind of realize that how people look or how we perceive them to be is usually not the reality you know just because someone's got a shaved head and tattoos and built like you know Sylvester Stallone or whoever's relevant um doesn't mean that they're walking around thinking about killing someone all that all day every day you know no, it's probably the five foot one girl that looks like she's a giant person but she's probably thinking about murder you know yeah. Yeah, too. <laughs> you know <laughs> on the topic of martial arts I did I, I did some jujitsu um and there was a girl who was about five foot one and she was lovely but she could definitely murder if she wanted like she she could murder you know, feisty and I totally <laughs> you know full respect to to the strong you know, little women. Good for them. Yes. <laughs> so, 
bit of a tangent there, but it happens on most episodes. Um, that's why, that's why, why we like it. I, I want to know about kind of without you, I, I'm not expecting you to, to give a course right now, but if a, mm-hmm. if a new photographer is like, hey, I want to do a one-on-one uh, with Alex, what, what, what would that be like? What, what's, what, what could they expect in kind of an overview, a, a brief overview? What could they expect from a, a one-on-one with you? Um, so uh, I'll ask you this. Technically, my one-on-ones are currently on hold. Okay. Um, they have been for about three months. Would you still like me to answer that question? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you know, because, you know, they make them <laughs> off hold. If you're happy to answer it. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Um, I, so I never take more than five students at a time. I think the one-on-one attention is really important, and I never want people to feel like they're part of, like, a mathematical system. Um, I want people to feel like individuals with, they all have individual course plans and programs, and it is specifically custom catered to that person's, you know, skill level and what they're trying to learn. So most of the time it is, you know, remote editing sessions. So we do them on Skype and on average, they're around 90 minutes long. And so we'll chat a little bit and then there will be a lesson plan and then we'll do some editing on my end, on their end with screen share. Um, so, for example, I'll demonstrate something, then they can practice. I have a lot of really fun exercises that I love doing that kind of illuminate um, purposes of techniques that maybe we weren't previously aware of. And so the most important thing during these sessions is always to get a deeper understanding of not just how we do something, but why we do it. And that's what I try, I try to do that in my courses, too. I'm not trying to, you know, it's really like teaching somebody how to fish, but on like a philosophical level. <laughs> That's not a good analogy. <laughs> I, I want people to be able to create their own techniques in their own style instead of just copy pasting a form. Yeah. So yeah. that's how I try to teach. And then I do also do in-person sessions, you know, workshops with models on posing with exercises specifically for how to communicate better, how to use better language and all of that. Um, so those sessions are really fun. and. I also always offer shadowing sessions. So a lot of my students are local and they'll just come along to my shoots. They're always welcome to join in. And, and that's always been fun. Yeah. I've been very lucky with the set of students that I've had over the last few months. They've been so, so fun and, um, and phenomenal to work with. Do, do you find more people approach you for the, the editing side or the, the photography, the, the in-camera kind of side? Well, the editing just gives more opportunity to work remotely. Um, So, uh, of course, only, you know, a small percentage of my audience is local. So, yes, most people do approach for that, I think, just for that sake. And I do believe I have considerably more to offer in terms of editing than shooting. I think I'm a very average shooter, but I think I'm I'm a little stranger of an editor. So... um, yeah, so I think a lot of people. What, what, so why do you think? Why do you th- why do you say you're an average shooter? Why do you think that? Um, I don't know. I don't. I think I I still shoot very strangely. Um, <laughs> <laughs> maybe not average, but I don't think I have any extraordinary shooting skill. But I also I don't see that many other people shoot. So that might be wrong. I, th- I think I've just seen more people edit. So I mm. knew that. I have different approaches to editing than the average person. Not necessarily better by any means, just different. Um, And in terms of shooting, there's probably less room to step outside the ordinary than in editing. Um, Unless you, you know, go into movement shots and, and perhaps cosplay and perhaps shooting for composites. But... That's to be honest. That's not something that I ever hit the level of teaching in. If that mm. makes sense. Usually, when I teach shooting, it's always foundations and basics. We never, I've never with a student gotten to the point where I get to show them how to make someone hang off of a building. You know what I mean? Well, I completely disagree that you're an average shooter. You know, I think I think that um, the the concepts, the putting it together. The, the model direction. I think this all goes under the umbrella of, of being a, a photographer, right? Um, and to to you, Photoshop or editing, whatever, can, in my opinion, never fix a bad photograph. You know, it, 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 I really don't think it can. Um, you know, it might be able to give it more life and a bit more identity, but 
a bad photograph will always be a photograph and it, it'll, it'll never be able to 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 hide behind any amount of processing. And, you know, I've spent a lot of time with your work, looking at it and reviewing it, and I, I'm yet to see a bad image, you know. And in fact, it's, um, and I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, as the ter- term is in the United States, blow too much smoke up your backside. Or I, I, don't, know, <laughs> I don't know where that even comes from, but, you know, I, I try and give in little <laughs> American-isms to appeal to our <laughs> audience. But... We can both try. Yeah, <laughs> but often when I think about some of these Americanisms, like I don't blow smoke up the backside. Why would anyone do? But yeah, you know, I, <laughs> this isn't me trying to give you an ego trip. It's just it's genuine. It's you know, I, I, I think, to, and I think a lot of what I experience with a lot of people who excel in Photoshop, they're, they're kind of a bit apologetic for their photographic skills, and I don't know why that is because you know, I, I think. I think the 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 two go hand in hand, and and one both need to be strong for the final outcome to be strong, and you know that's that's clearly clearly something that you're getting right. Otherwise, you know, you wouldn't be having the success that you're having. Thank you so much. No, you're you're welcome. To, to move over from, you know, I know it feel, can feel a bit uncomfortable when people are, are praising you. Everyone feels a little bit uncomfortable, unless you're a narcissist, which you don't seem to be. Um, <laughs> oh, God, I hope not. <laughs> t- tell me about these meetups. I saw on your Instagram you arranged meetups. Um, yes. What are they? Um, so my friend John and I, uh, his tag is John Snip. We've been doing meetups now for, I think, three years. That's a long time. Um Yeah, so I realize I'm actually coming up on, I am definitely in between four and five years on photography. I'm slowly coming up on five years of photography. So we've been doing meetups for three years. And we then, during pandemic times-ish, started working with World Shooters, which is an organization that's pretty global, but primarily based in the UK. And we opened up the Portrait Shooters division. And so now we do meetups under Portrait Shooters. So if you're ever looking for meetups, you'll find them under Portrait.Shooters. Um, and this one that we're doing that's coming up next is going to be, I think, pretty large. It's sponsored by uh, MPB, which is a uh, used gear trade-in company. Yep, yep. That's yep. really cool. I just bought yeah, a lens so from they're... them, actually. Sorry? I just bought a lens from them. Oh, you're kidding. How yeah, no, no. It, great, perfect. I, I, it, it was, sorry to interject, but it, the experience was so good. I don't know if this is because I'm getting older or what, but I was like, <laughs> I was like, hey, where can I let everyone know how good my experience was? Oh my you know? That's so great to hear. Came in timely. Everything was packed well. You know, the description of the lens was was great. And Aww. yeah, I was like, I need to tell people about this. Whereas when I was in my young 20s, it was, I would never, ever think about leaving a review. I love That's leaving true. reviews now. <laughs> oh my goodness. I've always wondered, I've always wondered about the, the kind of person that writes those like the essay reviews, you know, with like the pros and the cons and the ups. <laughs> yeah. like, and so now I feel like I'm on that trajectory. You're you're a you're a reviewer in the making. <laughs> I'm a reviewer. I, the world thanks you for your services. <laughs> we, need, we need more of you. I apologise. I interjected there. So so it's 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 um I always get that it's MPB or MBP. I, I always get the name. M- I think it's MPB. MPB. MPB, yes. So they help help out with facilitating, or what's that? What's yeah, that? so so they're going to be um, they're going to be doing a bunch of things to the portrait shooters, including some giveaways after the meetup, which is going to be really cool. Um, everybody that joins the meetup will be able to enter. And we also we try to serve a global community for the people that you know can't make it to local meetups. So at every meetup, we also take our own photos as the team and then we upload them as raw files for anyone to be able to use for free for any type of use so anyone editing those photos will also be able to then enter and so it's it's just meant to really bring the community together no matter where everybody's at um but yeah i love i love doing meetups sometimes some sometimes it can be a little bit overwhelming because um uh people there know me but i don't know them yeah so my social feel? anxiety says no <laughs> sorry how does that feel knowing that you know you don't know people and they all know you it's a little it's a little strange i i don't put my face in a lot of places so i've only been recognized 
very seldomly. Mm. Um, I know other people on social media who get recognized on a daily basis and that would stress me out muchly. Um, <laughs> but going to a meetup and, and having a similar experience where the, again, people there know me and know a lot about me, but I've, I don't even know their name or their face. It's a very strange dynamic that I'm still not used to after years of it. So that's, that's the strange part of social media to me. Yeah. So you're, you're currently sitting on over like 300,000 followers. And I, I never usually talk about follow count because I think it kind of takes away um, from the attention of the talent, right? You know, yeah. Um, so I try not to, but just because just we are talking about kind of people knowing you. And stuff, but what is that like? You know, you start off, you have, you know, I think you said when you started, it was at like 17,000 or something like that. When I first and went full time, yeah. When you first went full and then it just goes, what is, what is that like? Um, I have ironically been doing social media for a long time. I did YouTube before I did Instagram, but I've never done it personally, if that makes sense. So it's always been for a project or for a craft, yeah. um, primarily and not about me. So I think that's a great way to protect yourself from it emotionally, but it can still be very strange. It's still incredibly taxing because it comes with ebbs and flows. You have to be prepared to put out content. Um, that will be, you know, under many people's scrutiny. Um, there will be times of massive growth that you won't be able to emotionally keep up with. And there will be many times of no growth that you will have to stay motivated throughout mm -hmm. and not base your motivation and your action on everybody else's approval. So again, I have found the less I make it about myself and the more I'm just making it about my work, I can remove myself from it enough to not take any of it personally because it's not personal. It's just technology doing its thing and if we can kind of dissociate from it a little bit i think it makes it much more um digestible do, yeah absolutely do, do you get do you get much kind of negative feedback thrown at you or kind of you know mindless sometimes hurtful comments does that ever happen it's really rare uh knock on wood i've been very lucky and very fortunate and i'm um, yeah uh thank you universe because <laughs> It, it it happens very rarely. Sometimes a video that's going viral will hit a weird corner of Instagram. For example, you know, sometimes when my content hits photographers who are non-editor elitists, um, they will say too much editing and there's only one right way to do it. And I understand there are many different camps in terms of like, you can combine photography with graphic design and it's okay, or then it is no longer photography. And I'm like, I never said it was not graphic design. Um, <laughs> some people are very territorial and very elitist about just their craft being the right craft. They are. And I think we should just live and let live um, because I fully respect their camp and, you know, but sometimes again, people get like that. That's okay. And then I have to, again, understand not to take it personally. Yeah. Um, it's not about me. It's not about my art. It's just them having a very particular idea of a definition of something and they are rigid on that idea. And that is not my problem. So. I, I, I can see both sides um, to this in, in a sense that I've sometimes been guilty myself of being too, uh, never elitist, but just too like when, when NFTs came around, for example, I was very mm -hmm. against people buying NFT photography and, you know, and, and I've had phases myself, you know, I had that whole like, uh, I did no editing on this and look how great my image is and like anyone, you know, I had that kind of, you know? It, and, and, it, and it's, it, it's a good thing, but what I, what I'm learning and what, what I'm, you know, anyone listening to this that might have, you know, um, connect with that kind of, I'm going to say closed minded because I was being closed minded a, a lot of the time. You know, if, if, if we all did the same thing, we would never have such the, beautiful diversity and and you know just because someone's not doing it the way you do it doesn't make it right doesn't make it wrong it's their thing and hey if if you like what i started to learn was you know or what i started to to understand about myself is i, I was liking the final product but not liking how they got there and then i realized that makes no sense you know who cares you know <laughs> it makes it makes no sense if i like the final product it doesn't matter what they did and in fact it's, it can be quite interesting you know li li listening to you for, for, for the past 45 minutes and hearing like your process from ideas to to uh, pos um, posing models and you know coming up with scenes and things like that 
this is all like, wow, this is this is interesting stuff and food for thought. So good for you for just like, you know, hammering at it, even when, you know, some people may have been like, that's not the right way to do this, you know, <laughs> do it this way. It's like, nah, I'm, I'm going to do it my way. Thank you. Good for you. Yeah, I don't even, why, why would they want extra competition in their field? That's not <laughs> No, I'm, I'm happy when people don't do the same thing as I do. I'm like, you do you, because that means you. <laughs> yeah. So is there anything that we haven't spoken about that you wish we did? Um, um, I don't, I don't think so. We went so many places. I mean, there's always a million other things to talk about. I could talk to for the next five hours, but um, is there anything you feel we missed or didn't didn't pick up on? No, absolutely not. You know, I... I um, and, and I say this this to, to everyone that comes on and, and to the people that are listening, you know, we want this to be a very kind of organic, see where it goes. You know, if martial arts comes up, it comes up. You know, if if, <laughs> if the, the pressures of social media lifestyles and things like that comes up, it comes up. But, you know, there's, I always like to give the opportunity to, to, you know, I don't think it's right to call you a photographer. I think a, a multidisciplined artist is, is, is the right, the right thing of, of which photography comes, comes within. But, um, you know, if there was anything you wanted to share or anything that you're working on at the moment or that's coming up, then you're more than welcome to do so. If not, then you I'm can deal. I'm on working on a Valentine's Day set, which I'm not a big Valentine's Day kind of gal, but oh. um, I, I shot these photos, uh, cosplay photos of um, Guardians of the Galaxy, so Gamora and Star-Lord. Yeah. And very cute. They're very cute. <laughs> <laughs> That. That's what I'm working on right now. <laughs> will they be dropping on Valentine's Day or will it be after the fact? How long have we got? Four days? Three days? Um, probably the day before, but I'm in conflict right now because I'm not sure if I should post the photos and a video or just a video because lately it's just videos been where there's been traffic and photo not so much. But then it feels cynical to just say, I will stop posting photos even though I'm a photographer. <laughs> <laughs> but... I've been enjoying video a lot more because it gives the opportunity to add music and make it more dynamic and show the process within the post itself. So that's the format that I've been having the most fun with, regardless um, of how erratic traffic's been. So, um, yeah, we'll see. Excellent. Well, I do absolutely appreciate you taking the time out of your day and uh, having a chat with me. So it's nice to to get ins- inside the photographer's mind, which is obviously the name of the the, the podcast. So. Yeah, what I'll do is uh, we always put links in descriptions and on in the articles because if I say it out loud, everyone else, you know, concentration oh, yeah. expands nowadays. And um, yeah, we uh, we look forward to uh, seeing what you've got coming up in the future. We'll still be following you and uh, I wish you a very good day. Thank you so much for having me, Dan. This was such a pleasure. I really appreciate it. Cheers, Alex. You take care. See you later. Thanks, you too. Thanks again to Alex for joining us. Another reminder to please subscribe to the podcast by YouTube, Spotify, Google, and Apple Podcasts. We'll be back again next time with another episode of Inside the Photographer's Mind.